Uh, welcome, everyone. I understand there's quite a few ears out there listening. So anyway, I, I won't dilly dally here and get too involved in this. I'll try to be as concise as I can and just move on with it. Basically, what you're looking at on the screen, I just want to give you a brief history of the flood issues on the river of the San Joaquin as necessary to understand basically what the levy district's purpose is. The river and its tributaries have historically caused flood problems, which have been a threat to life and property. Every interest along the river has provided a defense for themselves by building levee embankments to divert flood waters away from their interests, which adversely affected other holdings. This approach offered no solution toward a general plan of flood protection. The solution occurred through the activities of federal, state, and local governments, and most importantly, the efforts of the landowners affected by the river. Flooding problems have been lessened, but not eliminated. This photo is of the location we call the Control Structures Bifurcation, which is the head of the bypass system. The map on the right is the location of the flood project relative to the San Joaquin River system. As you can see in the blue, that uh, we're pretty much in the center. You can see all the way down south to uh, Tulare Lake Basin and all the way up north to uh, the Delta. As this video flows, I just would like to uh, give you more background information. So we'll roll this video. It's of the Eastside Bypass that's in Merced County. Uh, basically, how things got initiated for the project here is the Federal Flood Control Act of 1936 declared a national interest in the prevention of flood damage. In 1940, the Army Corps of Engineers reported to Congress that certain projects for the control of floods in California's Central Valley should be adopted. We lost no, something ahead, here? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay, we just got a lot of confusion here, apologies. Uh, the flood control plan by the Army Corps proposed that in lieu of flood protection works, an area com compromising about 118,000 acres of floodplain between Bryant Dam and the Merced River be reserved for detention basins during periods of excessive runoff. The Corps estimated the total cost of the acquisition for this acreage at $800,000. This was 1940 numbers. Subsequently, in 1944, Congress authorized the Lower San Joaquin River Flood Control Project. California legislature approved the project proposal in 1946. However, after World War II, it was assumed that the acquisition of the floorage easements would take place during the course of construction of the flood control project. However, the acquisition of grass, grassland water rights by the Bureau of Reclamation in connection with the Central Valley Project and the occurrence of land reclamation along the river and the difficulty with flood operations at Fryan Dam in 1950 emphasized the need for reanalyzing the proposal. Also, the cost of the easement acquisition had increased to over the tens of millions of dollars during that period. Public meetings were held to acquaint the landowners in the areas affected with the proposal of floor easements and to obtain input from these affected parties with regard to control of floodwaters. Strong opposition to the easement plan developed because the reservation of large areas of unrestricted overflow would prevent full, full utilization of the lands. Basically what you're looking at is the consensus favored by further studies to develop a feasible plan for flood control projects showing confined channels. The final and existing flood project facility was the fifth plan in a series of deliberations. The Lower San Joaquin Levy District was authorized in 1955 by the California Legislature for the purposes of the O&M of this project. The Levy District maintains a project in accordance with the O&M manual developed by the state, which conforms to Army Corps standards. The Department of Water Resources governs the O&M of this project and regularly inspects the project in assurance that it's properly maintained. The Levy District boundaries were based on historical data as to areas subject to actual flooding and or receiving benefit from the project as it relates to the designated capacity of the project system. The boundary was established along existing section lines, roads, canals, drains, or other permanent lines that were reasonably close to the probable floodplain. The boundary description is incorporated into the legislative authorization of the Levy District and covers parts of three counties, which are Merced, Madera, and Fresno. The levy district revenue for this O&M is through benefit assessments on land parcels within the boundary of the district. Specifically, this is obtained through the Benefit Assessment Act of 1982. Of 
Each parcel is assigned to a category with an assessment value. The assessment is in proportion to the benefit received as it relates to each parcel's ability to be put into use and its size, which are or acreage. The total parcel count for the three counties is always over 4,200 parcels. The levy district is governed by a seven member board of directors and appointments are made by the board of supervisors of those appropriate counties. Merced County appoints three, Madera two, and Fresno appoints two. Before we discuss the flood project facilities itself, let's understand the upstream operations that release flows into the flood project system. Flows from these reservoirs, rivers, and streams are released per each facility's O&M. Through contact with the operators of these upstream facilities, coordination of the releases are attempted to assist in averting damages in the protected area. The reservoir that has the most impact on our operations is Millerton behind Fryant Dam on the San Joaquin River. Millerton, which has a 520,500 acre foot storage capacity, and the river channel downstream of the dam has a flow rating of 8,000 CFS. The district will operate these control structures at our own discretion if these flows exceed that 8,000 CFS. And the releases from Fryant takes about two and a half days to arrive. At the verification, the determination of how to split the flows is based on the event, the time of year, and on the flows from another reservoir, basically Pine Flat Dam on the Kings River. Pine Flat and its reservoir is a million acre storage capacity. The first 4,750 CFS of flood releases is diverted north at Crescent Weir on the Kings River toward Mendota Dam. <clears throat> releases from Pine Flat take approximately four and a half days to reach Mendota Dam. Flows exceeding 4,750 are diverted toward the Tulare Lake Basin until the release totals approximately 10,000 CFS and then it is split 50-50. The next reservoir that comes to into call of this is the Hidden Dam on the Fresno River, which has Hensley Lake behind it, which has a storage capacity of 90,000 acre feet. The channel rating downstream of that on the Fresno River is 5,000 CFS, and releases from Hidden take about one day to reach the flood system. The next reservoir is is Buchanan Dam on the Chowchilla River, which has Eastman Lake, which has 150,000 acre feet of storage capacity. The downstream flows are 7,000, with a split of 2,000 into Berinda Slough, which is the southern channel, and Ash Slough, which is the northern channel, has a rating of 5,000. Releases from Buchanan take about one day also to reach the system. As you get up further downstream, you get dealing with what's called the Merced County Stream Group. And basically, this is just a, uh, well, I'll say there's, well, there's about a half a dozen reservoirs up there. Basically, they're filling spills. So basically, the only thing that makes them, impacts them are rain flood events. And so what happens is once they get that fill and spill, then you have this proliferate of channels that continue onto the system that continue and add to the rest of it and it progresses further downstream. At this point, what I'd like to do is kind of give you some more background as to how all of these coordinate with each other. Basically, like I said, on the uh, on on the San Joaquin, what happens is you've got this is at 8,000 CFS here, and what happens is, like I mentioned before, if it's at beyond 8,000, then we can split it here and then down to Mendota Pool. But what happens during an event where both Millerton and Pine Flat do releases, Pine Flat and its 4750 consumes the river capacity downstream from Mendota Dam, which is rated at 4,500. So therefore, if, if Pine Flat is releasing their 4750, any water that comes from Millerton Lake cannot get into the San Joaquin River past the bifurcation. So therefore, the water is diverted into the bypass channel and then it coordinates with other flows as you get further down in the system. And also what we take into account too is if all of these reservoirs in the system are producing, then we have to start having, we well, we always have a conference call. But what happens at Milton Lake, you have two irrigation canals. The one to the south is a Frank Kern Canal that takes all the way, water all the way down to Kern County. And on the northern side, it's the Madera Canal. 
we've worked with the operators of these canals to have coordination with them to make sure that we can utilize them to help delay the time that the water gets to the system so there's some better coordination so the peak flows can uh, get through the system without creating a, a flood damage issue. So anyway, that's kind of the background of that. There's, there's a lot more involved in that. And in these conference calls, what we do is everybody has what's this terrific diagram. Basically, it's a communication on all the releases from the reservoirs. And this was created uh, by a gentleman by the name of Larry Freeman at the exchange contractors. And it's everybody really values this because it's very, very important. It's got a lot of data and information into it. And basically, it's something that helps people make decisions on what they're going to do. So anyway, it's just a lot more details and more information for everybody to understand. So basically, at this point, we're going to get into the, the actual facilities of the flood project itself. And basically, like I said, the project was constructed between 59 and 67, 1959 and 1967, since we're in the 21st century. And basically, it was uh, done through 16 separate contracts. It has a 50-year flood protection design. There are 191 and a half miles of levees and channels that they protect, and encompasses over 108 miles of the San Joaquin River. This is done through, there's four radial gated control structures that have a total number of 22 gates. And then also, there's seven drop channel channel drop structures, which helps with the erosion and uh, velocity of the, in, of the water in the system. And because of this, and like I said, we're not in the thawwig of the valley. The valley is further to the west. That, the lowest part of the valley is further to the west. So therefore, anything that's to the east of the, of the system has to have flat gates that allows local drainage to get into the system. And so that's built in there. And like I said, the number shows on the screen, there's 322 flat gates in the system. And we have to maintain those each and every time we receive flood water. Uh, basically, like I said, as the water comes down here, we click on this. And what you're looking at now is the what we call the bifurcation. This is the San Joaquin River. And basically, this is where the flows come in. We do the split here with the San Joaquin River. Okay. Yeah, the photo you're looking at is the, uh, the bifurcation at the San Joaquin. Basically, like I said, this is the upstream end of the San Joaquin. These are the two control structures. The one on the left is the San Joaquin control structure. It has a, uh, a rating downstream of 2,500 CFS on paper, but that's uh, less than that actu in actuality. And again, uh, all these flood events, as everybody knows, are all unique. Depends on the time of year or, or the type of event that occurs out there as to how much water can be diverted down the old San Joaquin towards Mendota Dam. Uh, early in the year, if it's January, February, that you can get close to 2,500 CFS in there. But if you have a late storm, like especially, especially during a snowmelt runoff, then the downstream uh, Mendota Dam is in irrigation operations, so therefore you're limited on the amount of water that you can send down there because of uh, their take on water. And so therefore, the balance goes into the Chowchilla Bypass. At this point, like I said, you, if the rating is 8,000 at this location. San Joaquin is rated 25 and the Chow Chill is rated 55. But like I mentioned before, if Pine Flat is pushing water into Mendota Dam from the backside, then what happens is no water can get into San Joaquin and any water from Fryant Dam that's in the San Joaquin has to go into the bypass. Like I said, it has a channel rating of 5,500 and historically there's been twice that number in there before. So anyway, uh, go back to the map and we'll just click on Mendota Dam. This is what I was referring to. This is Mendota Dam, which is basically an irrigation structure. It's over 100 years old. It's basically like a weir. It's got boards in it. Uh, the San Joaquin River upstream, this is where it comes from the bifurcation. And then further off to the right of the upstream, you see the Kings River north. This is where the water from Pine Flat comes into the system. And then downstream is the San Joaquin River past the, uh, the dam itself. So that's the point is, is that if they're pushing water on Kings River that takes up the channel capacity downstream of, the, of Mendota Dam, then we have to avert putting any water into this section of the river and it all has to go into the bypass system. What we try to do is trying to work to make sure that the water that's in the river past Mendota Dam does not exceed that 4,500 range or basically around 5,000 because downstream you've got City of Fireball that the river runs right through the middle of it. So we have to monitor that to make sure that the people in Fireball are are safe and they are comfortable with what uh, is going on. 
As you get further down on the bypass system, up and right, you click on, and uh, this is where the Chowchilla Bypass meets con the confluence with the uh, Fresno River. The, by the Chowchilla ends here at the county bridge, and then the east side bypass begins. But what happens here also is this Fresno River comes from Hidden Dam. Upstream from us, it's maintained by the county and not by us. So therefore, there's issues along that as far as uh, ongoing maintenance. And also, the San Juan, when the Fresno River comes through here, there is a, a small inlet here with a measuring gauge that allows the Fresno River to continue as far as water rights purposes. During a flood event, this is operated by other people. We do not touch this, this structure right here. And then you get back on the river and before you go further downstream, this is one of the takeouts on the San Joaquin that's always referred to as Sac Dam. It's a, it's a concrete structure, it's very old, but it was tosa. It was basically sax is what it was. Yeah, it's a picture on the wall. Anyway, but this is the Arroyo Canal here that's take out for a local irrigation district. And basically this is a subsidence issue that's occurring here and it's affecting their ability to gravity feed water into their system. So they're looking at possibly installing pumps. So that's going to be very expensive. Now we'll go back to the map. And basically as you get further down where the, uh, the bypass system after it brings in water on Brenda and Ash Lewis along with the Fresno River, then you get to an interchange with the river. It's always basically what's called is the interchange. This is, like I said, the sound, this is, again, I'm having trouble talking here. Uh, you see the east side bypass that just comes here. Here's the interchange channel. And this is the San Joaquin. The San Joaquin, again, like you mentioned before, it's rated at 4,500 CFS at this point. And here's the old San Joaquin River right here. This particular channel has not had flows in it for a, a many years, strictly because on paper when the project was constructed, they assigned a number of 1,500 CFS. Uh, the district through many years of maintenance and diverting flows found out the best they could put in there is about 500 CFS or less because there's an extremely high water table in this area where the water is about three feet below the surface. So any type of flows that impacts that creates a real problem for the adjacent landowner. So basically our perspective is that you don't put water into a situation where you're creating a flood problem. You're trying to avert that. So basically we're working to try and put the water in. We work to make sure that the water stays in the interchange channel and gets into the bypass system. Uh, like I said, this particular reach of the bypass on the right has a 12,000 CFS rating. This channel is 4,500, so downstream here, it's this portion of the bypass system is rated 16,500. And basically what happens is there's two structures here. There's the San Joaquin River structure, which has screw gates, and then there's one that's called the sand slew structure. They're basically, we'll go back to the map, we can click on those. The San Juan River, San Joaquin River structure itself is screw gates, but like I said, those have not been open for many years for the simple reason that I explained earlier, but they were built into the system as screw gates so you could run, open and close while water goes down that particular reach of the San Joaquin River. Uh, next one to click on would be, this is called the sand slew control structure. This is basically called a partial flume that's in the channel and it's nothing more than just a irrigation facility structure, but that was when they constructed back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and now it does not function any purpose for that. So it's basically just sitting in the channel and it never uh, has a, an adverse effect on floodwaters. It just goes through it or over it. And go back to the map again. Then you go further downstream and like I said, this is the east side bypass. What I've got listed here is this very uh, popular El Nido gauging station that everybody likes to refer to. What you're looking at, this is a portion of the bypass system where it's 1,600 feet across. Like I said, it has a channel capacity rating of 16,500 with four foot of freeboard. And what is, you're seeing there is the, the problem with this area. You're, this area gets a tremendous amount of sediment deposition, which encourages uh, vegetation growth. So what you're looking at, like I said, there's a lot of sediment vegeta sedimentation that has occurred in the channel. And the flows that are currently at this photo, this photo was taken in 06, and there's about 2,000 in there. And it's levy to levy. So therefore, what happens is you start getting more flows in there, and it just creates a problem. Like you see off to the right here, 
is the seepage problem. The longer the, this water is touching the levee, the bigger the problem becomes as far as seepage. So anyway, that's just uh, the system that you have to look at. And as you go further downstream, then we have another bifurcation, which is the head of the Mariposa bypass and the continuation of the east side bypass. The ONA manual stipulates that uh, if there's 16,500 in this system coming this way, the first 8,500 is to go into the Mariposa bypass. As you can see, that's why it's uh, there's 14 bays and the six in the middle are not gated. So therefore that allows the first flows to go that way. And then the uh, control structure off to the right is called the east side control structure. And we close that off to push water into the Mariposa. And in coordination with flows that happen during rain flood events from the Merced Stream Group, we have to close this particular east side control structure and so that any water that is in here does not go downstream of this structure here because it would prevent the Merced Streams water from getting into the system. So therefore, that's just part of the uh, things you, you uh, just pay attention to. And as you go further downstream, this is the Bear Creek Canal, Bear Creek structure, where of the Bear Creek, that it comes from the uh, foothills above Merced, as part of the Merced Stream Group. And the problem, well, I don't say it's a problem, I apologize. The challenge that occurs here is this channel is rated, uh, the, the amount of water that comes from Bear Creek just sheets across this. It doesn't come stay in the channel for much per se. And the downstream portion of the system past the patrol bridge, Bear Creek uh, bypass here, has a rating of 7,000 CFS. But on record, the best that's ever been recorded here is about 3,500. And the constriction is because there is a uh, gated structure here at the head of the Bear Creek as it gets into the system that uh, keeps water from getting in getting past that point, like I said, and it sheets across. And then you've got, um, this gives you a better example here. You don't have that one, David? I'm sorry. Uh, this is, I'm looking at just a, <laughs> okay, we're gonna run out of time. Yeah, we may go a little bit long, everyone. I apologize for that, but I hope that you can see that it's worth sticking around for. There it is, good job. Basically, this is that same location. This mm -hmm. is Bear Creek that comes out of the uh, Merced Hills, part of the Merced Stream Group. This is this east, the canal that runs adjacent to the uh, levees. It's called the East Side Canal. And adjacent to that is the levees itself. This is called Unit 22. And so what happened is the Merced Streams, on, like I said, the diagram show that they all pretty much just in the diagram come at, at, in the channel. But what happens is they don't they sheet across that land. So basically the water just comes across as a sheet. Nope, David's still trying to catch up. Sorry, David. No, you're good. Okay, okay. And then basically what happens is it only has four points for the Merced streams to get into the system. So what's happened is you get a lot of backwater and then Merced stream flows. And let me go back to the other one. So what's happened is this streets, you can see the east side canal that runs uh, north and south here. This water that sheets out here migrates past the end of this levee unit and gets behind the levees or to the, to the south, to the north here, northwest. So what happens is this becomes impacted with flood flows on the backside or the land side of this particular levee reach. So anyway, that's just part of how the system works, functions. Uh, Basically, this is just a general diagram of our annual work schedule. Basically, this just shows what the things that we generally do as things come up that, that need to be addressed. We alter our program. But what I'm, the reason I'm showing this to you is that uh, we're a small uh, agency. Uh, like I said, we, uh, we, the district covers over 300,000 acres of the three parts of the three counties. And we do that with a field crew of seven. So what happens is we get into a flood event that that field crew has to go out there and do flood patrolling on the levees. So the work that was scheduled is not is pushed back for the length of time, however, higher in existence the, the, the flood flows are present. So like I said, if you get water in the January, February, March range, then anything that's scheduled in here is pushed back until the end of the flood flows and accordingly through the rest of the year. So anyway, this is just 
give you an idea of the kind of work that uh, is needed out there. It's just the activity, the time of the year, and any personal equipment that are required. And basically, that's basically how the system works, what we deal with, and basic things that are coming up. This is something that's pretty basic with the system. This is the sedimentation of the San Joaquin. The San Joaquin River itself is a very erosive system, eros erosive river. So, ah, I mean you cannot open it. Oh, you have it? Okay. Basically, so you're looking at, that's the San Joaquin from, uh, that's the two levees on the left and the right. And you can see that there's continually sand in the San Joaquin as the flows rise and fall, that sand, that sediment moves and it moves just continually. And just go back to the map, Dave. And then the next one, click on that. And yeah, oh boy, I, I'm not getting any photos off my. So anyway, uh, basically what you're looking at, there's a sediment basin that's built into the Chowchilla Bypass. And you can see that it accumulates a lot of sedimentation. And what we do is we, as this particular reach of the system, or that, that, that sediment basin in the bypass is designed for, to uh, capture 200,000 cubic yards of material. And if you have a good event, it'll fill it up in one season. So basically what you're looking at, this is how much material is out there gets accumulated if you have continual events. And we work with uh, contractors and public agencies to uh, uh, remove it. And you see on the outside, there's mounds outside the levee roadway. And those were historically where the material was put, but you run out of space. And then also our equipment was getting uh, worked up, worked roughed up pretty good with the, the sand and the sediment involved there. So we just tried working with uh, contractors to try and remove the material. So anyway, and let me go to the next next slide, Dave. Next slide? Yeah. No, 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 the next presentation, just roll it. So basically what you're looking at here, this is the Chowchilla bypass. Below screen here is the head of the, is the control structure itself. And this is how much sedimentation that came through there in 2017, last year. So what I was talking about is the sediment basin. This is the beginning of it right here, and it, can, it encompasses this much of an area. So like I said, when the flows get slower, all that sediment drops out, then it creates this problem. So basically what you've got is, at the head of that sediment, you've got a mound of sand that's, that in this photo, it's approximately about seven feet deep. So this is what happened in 2017. And basically, we used a drone to document that. And then with the drone and the capabilities of the drone to, and a uh, third party to do evaluations on the calculations, you're looking at about 53,000 cubic yards and just that seven foot deep and just a good 200 yards distance there. So, and also another sediment problem is further downstream in Merced County. This is that other. On the period date. And basically what it is, is that has a lot of history to it. Uh, in 1984, there was a lot of sedimentation that occurred out there and the Army Corps came in and did a, uh, a channel excavation of the east side bypass. So back to that photo again. So basically what happens is all the sediment that was in there was pulled out in 84 after about 20 years existence of the system. Well, 1984 was 30 some years ago. So therefore we still have an issue of sedimentation there. But what the core did is they addressed it. What you're looking at is a cross section at the top. Basically it shows what their proposal was, was to excavate down back to design grade. And the next one, which is the, the, the plan, they covered about two and a quarter miles of this deposition. And the amount of material that they removed was 650,000 cubic yards. And it was all placed uh, back up one more. You can see right here, here's the disposal area. It's this little triangle piece to the right of the screen here. And that's where that, that particular amount of sand went. So, and then again, uh, spare, bear with me, okay? I'm, I'm having fun with it. Part of the design that was handed over to the levy district was a levy height disparity uh, for the Merced streams come into play. And basically what happens is that down on the lower screen, we always call it contract 3B, which is the, uh, the right levy. Well, what happens is the left levy was constructed, like I said, there were separate, separate contracts. The left levy was constructed 
per a 1961 design, which had 9,000 CFS coming out of the Merced Stream Group. Well, after it was constructed and before the right levy was constructed, which we refer to as 3B, the number that was coming out of the Merced Stream was elevated from 9,000 to 15,000. So that's a 58% increase. So what has happened is there's now a disparity between the right levy and the left levy of almost two feet. And that was constructed that way. It was turned over to the district that way. We brought it to attention to many people, but nothing has changed. So that's just something we deal with. You go out there, you're supposed to have four-figure freeboard. You get it on one side, but not on the other. So it requires monitoring and a lot of flood patrol. Here's another one that's one of David's favorites. This is a system, this was, uh, we've got two levee breaches and these levee breaches have been in there. The top one was a washed out drain pipe, uh, flat gate that happened in 1972 that was never put back in place. And I'll give you the, the history on that. And this picture below it to the right, that levee was cut by the adjacent landowner in 1969, basically because he forewarned the state that if you built this levee, all the water that comes from the Merced Stream Group would get out on the backside, which I explained earlier, and would be higher on him than it would be inside the system. So what has happened is he has a dairy off to the left of that photograph, and he had about three to four feet of water in his, in, in his dairy, and his cows were in it. So basically, he went and cut the levee, and basically it's the Stevenson Ranch, and uh, we've looked at trying to get it repaired, and he has basically forewarned us that if you try to fix, you try to put that back in place, he'll take you to court because it, the water that's on the outside has a chance to get on the inside. And with these two breaches, like I said, the the levee, the picture up top with the washed out drain pipe, this washed out where it was open just like the one on the bottom. And what the landowner did, uh, Stevenson Ranch, is they put in this drain pipe which has no closure on it on either side, which allows water to flow from the outside to the inside. And the reason I make that point is because during all flood events that we've monitored and observed, no water from the inside has ever gone out those two breaches. Everything on the outside always comes in. You throw a stick in there, you throw whatever in there, and the water is always flowing from the outside to the inside. So that's, so I guess the landowner knew what he was talking about. Okay, anyway, that's just something that is comical. We've looked at trying to, uh, as part of, uh, Proposals as maybe putting in weirs in there so you can control flows in case flows on the inside become an issue, become a problem for the outside. But again, our operation approach to putting in weirs would be you put the, if there's water on the outside, then you have to pull all the boards out of the weir so that the water can get in. And the Army Corps approach to the response to that, that is, that's adverse to what the real purpose of a weir is, is trying to keep water out. But that's just, how it is. Okay. Anyway, and also this is something that's been a hot topic for quite a few years is you've got subsidence areas, both in Merced County and in uh, Madera County. So basically what we're looking at here is in Merced County. Oh, you can't open it. I can't. We got it here. Basically what happens is, ah, you can, what happens is this, in, in 1995 with flows, we, that, like I said, this Seaside Bypass was wrote, has a rating of 16,500 with four foot of freeboard. In 1995, we had about 12,000 in there with about a foot and a half of freeboard. So there wasn't that channel capacity and we were having issues with it. We contacted the state and in 2000, the state came out and reconstructed the levy or raised the levy and it is uh, th three feet higher than the one foot that we had uh, raised in 1999. So basically, that reach of the system was raised four feet. So, can't do that. But uh, further down, Dave, we've got pictures here. On the, uh, click on that one. Basically, what you're looking at here, this is the East Side Bypass in Madera County at what's called Road 18 and a half. And this photo was taken in 2003. And basically, this is, like I said, the project was constructed in the early 60s. So it's about 40 years of erosion that occurred at there. And all you do, you don't need to click and just hit right. Go to the next row. Okay.
Yeah, the same, same, same arrow. Oh, same arrow. Yeah, so click on it okay. and just the key keyboard. Just go to the right. There should be a photo there. I can't. Okay, that's too bad. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, maybe I won't. <laughs> well, let me see. Let me see what I can do. Um, so I can escape from here, and you can. Sorry, we had a couple of technical issues on our end, so bear with us for one second. No, I don't have that going on. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're. We're kind of stuck then. Oh, wait. I lost my Oh, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. There you are. Basically, so what this photograph shows is this is a photograph that was taken 10 years after the first one. And you can see a tremendous amount of, set of erosion that has occurred. And we were very puzzled as to why in that 10 year span it changed so dramatically. So basically what we... So just to emphasize, so because we're switching around a little bit, this was the 2003 compared yes. to 2013. Right. So the, basically something was occurring out there. And basically as everything evolved in time, it was realized that subsidence was occurring. So. Uh, Yeah, we can go. And that, that's just another look at the same location. You can go to the next photo. You can see that there's another whole tremendous amount of, of uh, erosion that is occurring. And what's happening is that with that erosion, that, that with the subsidence, the, the slope of the land is changing. So therefore, the velocity is changing on the on the channel, and therefore, a lot more erosion is occurring, and that sediment's being carried further downstream. So. That's uh we have to skip we'll just skip the next one, David. We just nope. I, I lost I lost my here. My apologies folks for just having the technical aspect of it. Okay. Basically keep going. <laughs> Can you do that? Okay, well, I'm watching David's computer. Basically what had happened is uh, with the restoration program, there was a lot of LIDAR flown by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. And basically what you're looking at is subsidence uh, a map of the LIDAR. And basically the dark orange, you can see that's right where the bypass traverses that area. And you're looking at about a half a foot a year subsidence that is occurring. And that, and that was in 2011, 2012. And basically what happens is you've got the next one is 2015-2016. They're still on. The Bureau monitors every six months. They fly a LIDAR and get the data for that. So basically this, we're just showing an accumulation of those dates. And then the next one is basically the accumulation between the five-year period. But you can still see that the orange, the, the uh, amount of land that's subsiding out there is uh, a little over a foot a year. I mean, uh, almost a foot a year, three quarters of a foot. So anyway, so basically, we want to know well, what's happening out there. What you're looking at here, this is a profile of the bypass in that general area. And you can see the green line in, on the profile here is 2008. And then the other two are 2012, 2013. So you can see where the subsidence is occurring in that dip right there. And what's happening is channel capacity is primarily a function of the geometry of the channel cross section and the channel slope gradient for a given flow. And of these two parameters, only the slope gradient is significantly impacted by land subsidence, as long as there is no extreme differential subsidence from one level to the other. And in this case, you're not going to have that because this is a basin that encompasses about an eight mile rate a diameter. So therefore what happens is slope gradient is directly related to the ground elevation. So therefore the changes in the ground elevation can have a significant impact on the slope gradient and thus affecting the channel capacity and velocity of flows. 
Typical subsidence pattern results in an increased slope on the upstream end of the channel and a decrease slope on the downstream portion. This pattern impacts flows to where flow leaving the subsided area loses velocity, impacting upstream flows by causing a rise in water elevation states and creating a loss in design freeboard and possible levy failure or overtopping. And uh, go to the next one which is basically this is something the DWR has been monitoring. And basically off to the left, you can see this is a portion of the bypass system in Merced County. And what's prevalent here is what I was explaining to you is, of course, what happens is this is the area uh, to the right of that uh, where the errors are designating of where the subsidence is occurring. So the flows are going from the right to the left. And as they get into this area where the bypass is between the arrow points, this is where a lot of this velocity slows down, a lot of the sedimentation falls out, and you have a problem. And basically, you can see the numbers. And this was a report that was done in 2014. It was designed for 16,500, but uh, that was, and they were expecting by 2016 that the channel capacity would be reduced by 20, almost 25%. So that's just uh, one of the things we have to monitor. And basically, also, we did a, uh, Computer model, basically on what I was relating to, is if this area where that dot is off to the right, this would be the area downstream of here is where the sediment, sediment, uh, sedimentation will be accumulating, and any break would occur would be on this side. Well, I don't say it would occur, but that was the one we chose. And basically, the flow of water would be against the levee for this distance, and at that distance you're looking at is to the confluence of the Merced River is 32 miles, and that is about maybe almost a mile across. So anyway, and also what's significant in showing this photograph, as I alluded to earlier, this is that unit 22 at Bear Creek. And when the water gets on the backside, it gets up against here. And now this is just a simulation, but what this is really showing you is the actuality of what happens out there during a regular flood event with a Merced stream group. So that's why there's those two breaks at this closer to the Highway 165 to the left. So anyway, this is just a simulation, but it does give you a good idea. And basically, computer modeling and the simulation are tools to help you figure out and understand what you need to do in certain situations. So the next one is a, uh, whoop, I'm just, uh, basically what happens, is this is an area in Western Madera County where the subsidence is the most severe. Like I said, this is the one that has about an eight mile uh, diameter basin. And basically what happened is you've got landowners out there who are being impacted. So what's happened is they have pulled themselves together along with associated uh, irrigation districts and water companies to try and figure out how to address this issue. And what you're looking at, you know, like I said, this colored area, this is a list of landowners and the parcels involved. And then you can see these down at the lower part, you see these uh, free-forming free blues, uh, designations and what they've done is they had a uh, geologist go out there and, and determine where the best percolation ponds should be located in order to divert flow and what's in the purple are the channels that are going to be provided that would provide water for that percolation pond so basically what you're looking at is the purple that goes all the way through it that is the bypass system and that is what they're looking at and along with uh, other people that are looking at uh, trying to balance out their groundwater uh, withdrawals. So anyway, basically that's that's what's going on. There's a lot more information involved in that, and, but what they need to do is use these channels to try and uh, divert water out of there to the percolation pond so they can help. And what's happening is they want to bring the upper 300 foot, the upper aquifer, which is about a 300 foot depth, get more, more water in it because these landowners, this is an unincorporated area. All their, their water is basically from deep wells. And what they're doing is they're just chasing water down. Uh, some of the wells out there are in the 1,200 foot range. So therefore, they're just chasing water further and further down. And what's that happening is it's just collapsing the ground above it. As these aquifers get drained, the clay aquifers collapse and you can't bring those back. So therefore, the subsidence is forever. So that, that's what's occurring out there. So anyway, we'll, and what's occurring with them as far as the work that needs to be done is uh, 
Well, this is a list of what the landowners are doing and also for the irrigation districts. What we're doing is we're working, I could say the underlying what we basically work with. We're working with DWR in determining flood carrying capacity. We're working with DWR and I mean the upstream reservoir operators on what the problems are downstream so that when they release flows, they're cognizant of, of reduction of channel capacities. And like I said, and we're also working with landowners out of the bypass system to develop recharge ponds and turnouts, either existing or proposed. And basically, like I said, the monitoring, this is a continual, like I mentioned before, the Bureau does uh, collects data semi-annually, DWR does it annually, and also they're always doing continual updating the hydraulic models and updating the channel capacities in the system. So getting back to that point of where the discharge ponds, we have a lot of landowners who want to take water out of the system, and this is just an example of what they do. This is a temporary takeout of floodwaters, and you can see there's that's a lot of work. There's a lot of equipment out there, and so they're trying to. And this is only temporary, so when the flood elevation change, when the water elevation change, they have to relocate. So, and then the next one, we've got some landowners that are a little bit more uh, uh, assertive in why they want to do it. What they've done is the upper left photograph, their inlet for their pump is on a floating device that just goes up and down with water elevation. The pipeline goes across the levee. You see they gravel it so that we can have access. And then they have a pump on the outside that puts it into their system, which averts them having to go into inside the channel and have to move any type of equipment. So this thing just goes up and down as the flows go up and down. So I, we like this approach and anybody that's asked us and to, if they can do temporary, we try and emphasize to them that this is what we would prefer. And then also, like I said, this is temporary, but what is happening now is with a lot of uh, the, the uh, Groundwater Management Act and a lot of land that needs to be uh, monitored as far as uh, groundwater withdrawal, you're having this kind of an issue. We have, uh, like I said, the upper left, you said upper left photograph, when I mentioned the 322 flat gates, that's a good example of what they look like. There's a concrete structures with a square flat. This is a large one. And basically what the landowner is doing, the adjacent landowner, is they are getting a permit from the Central Valley Flood Protection Board to take that flat gate out and put a, a combination flat gate screw gate so that they can manipulate that with flood flows present, they can open the screw gate and take water out for their irrigation purposes on the outside, but as long as they're adjacent to the property, adjacent to the bypass. And they do that with, they have to build a catwalk and, all that, and they have to get a permit from the flood board on that. And so there's, that's a good approach. We've seen that more than once. And so the next photo is other uh, types of takeouts. On the left is a uh, manual operative uh, screw gate, which you said you've got a diversion box there. There's a pipe at the bottom of that that goes out to the middle of the channel and it's gravity fed to that and they can open it up and put water out of their system on the outside. The one on the right bottom is a slant pump installation. This is existing. But with the uh, interest now in trying to capture as much flood water as possible to put out on their lands for whatever purposes, what you're looking at is a slant pump installation that is existing, but now just uh, in the last couple of months, we've uh, seen about half a dozen of these applications come across our desk. And like I said, they have to get permit from the flood board to do so. But, and the point is to try and get capture some water to put it out on our system. Basically, the next photo, that's a video. You can click on that, David. And basically, what you're looking at, do a pause there if you can. Yes. Okay. Basically, this is the east side bypass. That channel coming from the left is called Berenda Slough. That's the one that's coming from uh, uh, Buchanan Dam. But as you can see off to the right of the top of the photo, there is a water pond that's sitting out there to the right, David. Okay. Right there it is. And basically that is the local landowner has set aside a whole section of land, which is about 640 acres. He put a one foot uh, levee around it. And you can see down here to the right, David, do you see the slant pump in against the levee? Yeah, you can, right there. That's the slant pump that I showed you earlier. And he's taking that water out of there and pumping it along with other temporary ones further upstream <clears throat> to that location. And in the flood flows that we had last year from 2017 in a six month period, <clears throat> excuse me, he put in over 30,000 acre feet of water into that percolation pond <clears throat> for his purposes. So 
that's the approach that's going and that's what everybody is, is kind of looking forward to. So there's a lot of adjacent landowners who would like to do the same thing. So we're, we're going to be seeing a lot more applications for this kind of operation. So next one is, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the, on the political side of it, this, you see, this is the regional flood management plan or the RFMP as most people refer to it as. And in our area, the plan is basically almost the same uh, footprint as the levy district. So therefore, we worked along with the JPA to develop uh, uh, proposals to help with flood protection or flood minimization of flood damage. And basically, there were 84 proposed projects in the system. The reason I included it here, <clears throat> a significant number of those were those that I showed you earlier of where they wanted to take water out of, a of the bypass system for water onto their lands. And a, a good number of those are wildlife refuges who want to use the same approach to help with uh, waterfowl habitat. So I, that, that was the purpose of that. And also what's occurring is uh, we're getting, uh, working with uh, DWR during what's called the Flood Coordinated Operations Program or the FCO. Uh, in 2005, everybody's probably familiar with that. DWR initiated the this kind of a multiple a phase on the Yuba Feather River, and basically it's been very successful, so they wanted to implement it in other areas, and uh, San Joaquin is as good a place as any, so that's what they're doing, and you can go to the next one, Dave. Basically, this is the map of the air, of the reservoirs, all the ones, the one to the right, that's Pine Flat Dam, and then the next one to the left is Fryant, then uh, Hidden and Buchanan, the Merced Streams, and then you got the other rivers, which are the Merced, the Tuolumne, and the Stanislaus. And basically, this is a combination we're trying to work with, with through the DWR through a consultant to try and come up with what it would take to do a, a FCO and with the San Joaquin River. So like I said, there are significant benefits with it. Like I said, they're listed there. You can go to the next one, David. And basically, what uh, there's elements of it that are you, that you need to develop, and also uh, it provides a platform for basically doing a better forecasting of peak flows and managing those peak flows. So anyway, that's just what's going on. We meet quarterly, and so therefore everybody, we have, it's a really good uh, group. Uh, like I said, it's all the interest through this system. So I, I appreciate their DWR's effort in that. But in the next one, David. And basically, then we get another, a more political aspect of it. You have the San Joaquin River Restoration Program. Basically what you're looking at here is a map where the settlement of the uh, for the San Joaquin River restoration on the right is from Fryant Dam all the way up to the top left, which is the confluence of the Merced River. And in between, you've got points in the system where the San Joaquin has difficulty with uh, fish flows or the flows that are required for fish restoration. So therefore, they're also looking at the bypass and utilizing it for fish flows. So therefore, there's a lot, I, yeah, we could go longer than it the time necessary for this. But anyway, there, our objective when working with the restoration program is to make assurance, work with them to assure that there's no compromise to the purposes of the flood control project and to make sure that we're kept intact and kept whole. So anyway, you can go to the next one, David. I'll just work off you. Okay. Is that uh, they, what they've done is they, they've got reaches in the rest, rest, river restoration program. And what this map shows is just a prioritization of those reaches where they're looking at certain reaches to do like go first. And our issue is that, you know, they're, they're working with adjacent landowners and adjacent landowners are having issues with seepage issues. So what's happening is they're having to do mitigation for those seepage issues and damages to crops. And in some situations, they're also acquiring property. They're buying private lands. And that's our problem is what I alluded to in the beginning is our revenue for O&M comes off assessment off these private lands. Once it becomes public property, we cannot collect assessments off that. So as what's happened in one situation, uh, well, God bless the uh, landowner, he got the bureau to buy the property, it's 400 and some acres, but he got to lease it back and do the same thing he was doing before, but without the uh, assessment from us. So therefore, I, I talked to the bureau, the, program about that and they assured me they would never let that happen again but they're still in the business of acquiring property which takes it off our tax rolls it reduces our revenue and then also some of the work that they're doing increases our maintenance which will you can go to the next one David. basically this is reached to the San Joaquin River this is upstream of the bifurcation 
And what you see in front of you is the river restoration flows and all of that vegetation, that small vegetation you see, those are willow trees. So what's happened prior to that, the Bureau never sent water that way past that past that point because they had the exchange contract where they stopped water at Gravelly Fort, so therefore this portion of the channel was dry, so therefore vegetation was, was not uh, relevant. So, but you can click on the next one, Dave. So basically what you see here, this is a picture of one of those willow trees, and this is in a five month period that willow tree grew to over five foot tall. So you can see the number of trees behind it. If you If that goes unabated, then you're going to have a channel that's totally clogged with vegetation and it's going to become a problem not only for restoration but also for flood and our issue is that the low flows that they they're showing here for fish flows that's fine at that level but we have to look at the extreme we have to look at maximum capacity in these channels if you have anything that's going to be a constraint to it it causes a problem so therefore this it has changed our approach and how we do maintenance in this portion of the channel it's increased our cost and what that does is like say we're on a assessment per acre and if you have so many acres within the system then I associate it with like uh, Social Security you've got a flat amount of money to deal with and you have to do with the best you can so what happened is we got increased uh, maintenance in one location then some other area is, is being depleted of some kind of, uh, of maintenance anyway we try and do well this is a good one here this is uh, one of the other challenges that has occurred and David and I have had a lot of discussion on this one along with the core is that this map shows this is just a simple example of the project itself and that red line is the fresno river that goes up towards a hidden dam but that portion of the river is maintained by Merdera county and so what happened in the Corps evaluation of these levees they incorporate the fresno river as one unit so therefore that unit that Madera county maintains or don't maintain fails but that continues into our unit that we maintain so therefore they look at that as a system rating approach so our units fail along with the Madera County one so we have a disagreement on that but that's the core's approach <clears throat> and that's not the only location so there's that's issues right anyway let's go to the next one David this is very interesting this is basically a letter that was received from the Corps of Engineers to the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and it basically states that they cannot find any documentation that says that they accepted the project that we maintain as being federally authorized, federally recognized. And be, with that statement, what it does is it removes us from being eligible for public work, PL 8499 recovery costs. And also the state's criteria for being in the state plan of flood control stipulates that you have to be federally recognized. So therefore, where are we? So I've been assured by members of the reclamation of the, the Central Valley Flood Protection Board that we're still in the state plan of flood control because the project is owned by the state. It was designed by the state. So how can it not be in that program? So anyway, the state doesn't agree with the Corps position. So they're working to try and resolve that issue, but nothing has been resolved to date. I'm sure everybody has heard this conversation before. So anyway, go to the next one, Dave. And then another issue, like I mentioned before, is when the Bureau buys lands for the restoration program, it takes off the tax roll. This is just another example of that. What you're looking at here, this is public land. This is a Merced County and a, a identification of the public lands that are in the county and that red line that encompasses the flood project through Merced County. Basically, there's about 97,000 acres of our project of the our district in Merced County and about 26,600 of that is under public ownership that we don't receive assessments from but yet the project goes through those properties and we still have to maintain them so therefore again it's, it goes to the issue we're doing maintenance in an area we receive no revenue from and so some other area is receiving something that we could be less of anyway just it, it just bothers me so anyway that's the so yeah go ahead David and uh, as an association with that uh, downstream uh, as part of the Kesterson uh, mitigation or, or resolve that happened many decades ago you've got uh, now it's called the Great Valley Grassland State Park 
And now what they would like to do is they would like to breach, go to the next one, David. And the left photo shows that there's two breaches that they would like to do in the levee in order to start doing some floodplain restoration on the park. And our proposal is that you don't have, you don't give us any assessment, but yet you need to get a permit from the flood board to get your, uh, to do the breaches and whatever, and the Army Corps has to be involved in that. So our approach is that, how about if we just abandon those levees at the bottom end of the system, you create a problem for the property owner on the right side, the right levee, by, as you can see in that photo right there, as you get further downstream, it pinches the channel to where uh, it creates a backwater issue and creates seepage on the landowner on the north. So our approach is that we receive no assessment from state from the, the grasslands state park. So why don't we just uh, abandon this portion of the levee, and that way it's your your property and you can do with it what you want. But again, there's other issues involved because there's as evaluations after you've done how do you, how do you protect Highway 165 now if you don't have those levees, and also the flood board has to approve it. So anyway. There's, there's a lot of other things that have not been resolved yet, but that's an approach and we're just looking at that opportunity. So next one, Dave. A lot of good things have happened, again, prior to a lot of this other stuff that occurred with the Army Corps of not looking at us as part of the, 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 the uh, federal recognition, is they came back in, in 2008 and they did some flood damage response action. Let's go to the next one, Dave. Basically, they came in and they did the slurry wall installation. They basically, we had a problem with uh, levy foundation concerns because of a tremendous amount of seepage. And basically, you can see that the, the, the land side on the left is lower than the channel on the right. So on the right behind the, uh, the excavator. So basically, the longer the water's in there, the more seepage is going to concern, and we had real problems with that. And so basically, go to the next one, Dave. And basically, if you've never been associated with uh, a slurry wall, that green line at the bottom there, you're looking at about three miles of slurry wall that was installed because if you go further path, further south of that, at the bottom of the, the picture there, is the city of Fireball, a little down below the river on the right. You're, you're close. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, that, that was three miles of slurry wall that was pulled in at a cost of $14 million. And that was done through proposition money and PL8499 money. But if we're not in uh, state plan of flood control, we're not PL8499 eligible, then that is not available. So anyway, go ahead. So anyway, this is kind of what they do. They just have a uh, stockpile of material, and they also have a pond near the stockpile where they mix the material, then they pump it to the location. If it's a further location, then they have another pump station that helps it further along. And then the slurry installation on the right, lower right, shows uh, what happened. And then the next photo, next one is basically what it happens. This is what it looks like when it's complete. It's the slurry wall is done, it's set up, and then you have to come in and just basically cover it up. And it's ready for the, hopefully it's ready for the next event. Go ahead, the next. And this, I'm, I'm getting close to the end here. I appreciate everybody hanging in if you're still hanging in. Basically, what we have is, uh, thanks to grant programs, uh, the flood system repair program or project, we've got, uh, we were able to do 32 and a half miles of graveling of our all-purpose levees. And usually in our budget, we do about four, about four miles. And now that we got 32 and a half miles done at a cost of $2 million. And basically, it's a cost share issue. And what we did is we worked with DWR in the program our cost share was 10% of the cost, and what we did is we did uh, in-kind services. The DWR bought the material and transported it to the sites, the locations, and we put it in place. We rented uh, equipment, we water truck and a roller. We have our own grader, and basically we put it in place, and it covered our our cost share. So that that's out there for everybody. It, it works. And go to the next one, Dave, please. And basically what you're looking at here is the next FSRP project we got into, which is a rehabilitation of electronic equipment at our control structures. As I mentioned at the beginning, these control structures were built in the late 50s, early 60s, and the electronic equipment that operates them was still there. So what's happening, if something breaks, you've got a tremendous problem getting a replacement part. And so what we did is we've been working for years to try and find funding to do that. And with the grant application with the FSRP, we were able to acquire that. 
And what we did is part of our cost share is the lower left at the bottom where the uh, backhoe is, is we dismantled all the old motors and did all the installation on the new motors under uh, uh, guidership from the manufacturer. So basically what you're looking at is what they had to do, they had to dig up the old uh, trenching, take out the old wires and put in new wires. And basically what you're looking at in the lower right is the new pump. And what that does is it just makes it more convenient for us as a fact, we don't have to worry about situations if we get a failure. We had we have an electrician that we uh, have on retainer and with the old motors. It took him two years to find a replacement part at one point because of issues with the old system. So anyway, this is basically this is the positive things. And again, this is there's a lot that's going on with the levy district and a lot that we're trying to stay ahead, keep our heads above water, literally. So basically at this point, uh, you can go to the next one, Dave, and start that. It's basically, I'm done. If there's any questions,